Greetings all. Thank you for joining us to learn more about the National Museum of Women in the Arts and our upcoming renovation and restoration project, as well as our Space to Soar campaign. I am Christina Knowles, the Museum's Director of Development, Annual Giving and Membership. We so appreciate you being a part of our NIMWA family and um, for the essential support you provide for the museum and our work to champion women in the arts. Today, our wonderful director, Susan Fisher Sterling, and our project's architect, Sandra Vicchio, will give you a preview of what is next for NIMWA. We invite you to post your questions or comments in the Q&A box, please, as we go along. And then at the end of uh, their presentations, we look forward to answering some of your questions. Over to you, Susan. Oh, thanks uh, so much, uh, Christina, and welcome everyone. Um, may I have the first slide, please? So I wanted to begin with this uh, beautiful uh, photograph of our building and to tell you that I am coming to you from my office at the museum where we have been open uh, to the public since March 3rd with exhibitions of uh, Sonia Clark her first ever mid-career retrospective, uh, the uh, works of Mary Ellen Mark, a show called Girlhood, and then a beautiful book arts exhibition of Julie Chen that deals with issues of guilt and longing, which I'm sure we all have felt uh, during the pandemic and even now that we're coming out of that. Um, but here's our building. I may have the next slide. I thought that we should also uh, take a moment just to recognize the passing of our founder um, and that by preserving and renovating our building, we really are carrying forward uh, Mr. and Mrs. Holiday's vision for the museum, their dreams for what it will be in the future and the dreams of of course, countless uh, women artists now and uh, to come. Next slide. So restoring our building is the best opportunity that we have to extend our mission and to leverage our growth. Uh, and that mission is even more necessary uh, now than perhaps we thought it would be. Uh, when 46% of artists in the United States are women, and yet, as we know from a recent ArtNet survey, only 11% of acquisitions in museums and major museums last year were over the last years was, were women artists. And I think it's 14% of exhibitions in major museums over the past 10 years, I think, ha only 14% have been solo exhibitions of women artists. Uh, there is still a tremendous amount to do. And so with your advocacy and your support as members and friends of the museum, we continue our great good work, as I call it, uh, to correct centuries of imbalance, to try and reach that tipping point in favor of a women artists' representation. Next slide. So as the first museum in the world that's solely dedicated to this cause of championing women in and through the arts, we have the responsibility uh, to move that cause forward. But we also are bringing our humanity forward in a way that perhaps we didn't realize was so important until the pandemic. And we're doing that both in person and online. And I love this photograph of Deputy Director Chief Curator Katie Watt in our Sister Carita Kent exhibition. And I think of the Sonia Clark uh, mid-career survey as having that same uh, resonance of making our voices heard. Next slide. So like you, uh, we, and I love this idea of unleashing the art. Uh, like you, Nimwa believes that art is a catalyst for positive social change and um, that great art is a prism through which we can view the great issues of our day, especially as they impact uh, women and girls. Next slide. 
and advancing scholarship being that essential resource uh, in ways that are sometimes traditional and oftentimes untraditional, our library and our archives will continue to be available even when the building closes for renovation. That's something we have made sure of. Next slide. Uh, to thrive and to grow, we have to ensure that we meet the needs of our visitors both today and uh, tomorrow. And we have found certainly during the pandemic that we have to come to you wherever you are and however you wish to connect with us. And again, that was an odd, uh, I, I can't say there are any silver linings to this uh, COVID pandemic, but it is a lesson that we have learned uh, from the pandemic. Next slide. And so the greatest opportunity to extend our mission and leverage our growth is to restore the building that we call our home. Um, and that gives me the opportunity to introduce uh, NIMWA's lead architect, uh, Sandra Vicchio of Sandra Vicchio and Associates. Uh, Sandra has more than 30 years of experience with preservation, restoration, and the presentation of cultural heritage. She has a remarkable reputation in the field for projects including uh, Monticello's Visitor Center, the George Washington Library at Mount Vernon, the Washington Monument in Baltimore's restoration, the collection space plan for the Smithsonian, the environmental master plan for the Walters Gallery, and the Enoch Pratt Library, one of the earliest public libraries in our country, which is located in Baltimore. Interestingly, Sandra's work on the Pratt Library, which has spanned uh, much of her career, was the most compelling to us because it really prepared her for our preservation and renovation project here at the museum. She was involved uh, from the owner's side in everything related to the Pratt Library, the program, the construction phasing, the offsite operations, the furniture, the art, the aesthetics, the systems, the signs, the capital campaign, the preservation, and ed the education, and essentially helping to create an institution that would be a national benchmark as a 21st century learning center. So as you can tell from the Sandra's resume, she has a deep commitment to art and to objects. And our project here at the museum has offered her a new opportunity to work collaborative, collaboratively with us as the museum looks to the future. And she also helps to challenge us to think about who we are at the Women's Museum and what that means in our world, not just today, but moving forward. So Sandra, um, uh, feel free to begin. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you, Susan. And it's really good to be with everybody at NMWA today. I wanna follow up on Susan's, uh, I will say very kind introduction with a little story. When I was an intern architect at Robert Stern in New York, I went to my first big out of town project meeting. We had to fly, I was pretty excited. And with more than 25 people in the room, I was the only woman, I was nearly the youngest and I was certainly charged with taking the notes. So you can imagine how years later when at an early meeting for NMWA's project, we had about 25 people in the room. There were two men, both taking notes, and everyone else was a woman. So this certainly changed the dynamic for me. And I feel very fortunate to be the leader for a project that combines preservation and renovation of a cultural institution that's dedicated to art by women and that is led by women. Next slide. This mission of NMWAs inspires me as well as members of my team, two of whom from CVM Envelope Consulting you see here with me on NMWA's roof. This project has marked multiple milestones for me, but for the National Museum of Women in the Arts, this preservation and renovation project is critically important and absolutely imperative to the museum's future. Even with good stewardship, three decades of daily use, a burgeoning collection, and tremendous advances in technology, 
necessitate changes to this beautiful historic building. To thrive and grow, NMWA must upgrade and renovate its space, ensuring it meets the needs for today's visitors and advocates. Over the past five years, we've created a comprehensive engineering and architectural plan that will bring the museum up to current standards in many areas, including mechanical systems, lighting, ADA compliance, fire suppression, conservation of the building's interior, and safeguarding the art, visitors, and staff inside the building. We see NMWA's future clearly. This renovation is both necessary and timely. And the best example I can offer of that fact is that let's, if we start at the roof of the building, which I always see as the first layer of protection, I'm gonna back up to 2016, when on a Friday, we kicked off our very first project, the preservation study for NMWA. So that was Friday. And by Sunday, Washington DC had had a major blizzard and my very new client, NMWA's Director of Operations, Gordon Umbarger, called me Sunday morning with the news of the gutter collapse, which you see illustrated in the top photo on the left. By Monday morning, we had our team on site to secure it, and the roof restoration project followed. That took nearly a year's time and over $1.2 million in insurance repairs, but it gave us a lot of knowledge about the building and the conditions we'd be addressing. Next slide. The next layer of protection, logically, of course, is the walls of a building. These are thermographic images by our envelope expert, CVM, and they illustrate the existing condition. So you see a wide variation in color in the images. The dark purple is cold temperatures, and the bright oranges are hot temperatures. So you can see in the left-hand images that the building is losing a lot of heat in the wintertime through the windows and the cornices. And in the top two right-hand images, you can see that there is a wide variation in temperature across the walls where the art is hanging. These are problems we absolutely need to fix to safeguard the collection and the display of any further exhibitions. Next slide. The facade restoration scope includes restoring, renovating, and reimagining the museum for the future on the exterior, we're gonna address each element, the roof, the cornices, the windows, the masonry, the railings, the ramps, and the stairs. Next. So we've talked about the outside of the building and now at the inside, of course, the foundation of NMWA is its collection. Given the advances in collection storage furniture and technology over the past 30 plus years, we'll be able to have secure properly conditioned collection storage. And what you see in this 3D model of the collection storage are compact movable racks for paintings at the top, sculpture and object storage, works on paper and photography storage, including large scale photographic works, and along with video and digital storage units. All of this will enable us to safely store more art and more different kinds of art it will also create new workspace for staff and conservation. You can see a little workstation there at the bottom. Next slide. So we move up to the entry lobby where our goal is to have a first floor that is much easier for visitors to navigate so they don't have to find their way around. On this slide, you see a design sketch on the left and a concept sketch on the right. Ticketing and coat check will be immediately on the left to greet you as you enter the building. Security will have oversight of the entry and the space, and three flat panel displays will provide information on what's on view and convey messages about daily activities or special events. Next. The next space in your entry sequence will be the rotunda, and that space serves multiple roles. I think most importantly, it's an inspiring space in which to display new art like Vasconcelos Rubra, which is shown hanging from the ceiling in the image on the screen. We're also suggesting a shade of blue paint at the ceiling of the space to reference the sky. The sky is the limit for women artists. Next slide, please. The rotunda is also a transition space between the activities of arrival and the exploration of the museum. And in that role, it will have a new recessed information desk 
easier entry into the long gallery and a better view of the Great Hall. When you move from the rotunda into the elegant warmth of the Great Hall, it's going to feel even more magical. This image also illustrates the design intent for the new donor wall. Of course, none of this work would be possible without the vision and generosity of the donors. So thank you for that. Next slide. I wanted to show you this image, which looks a little bit different because it is of the museum's Great Hall, because it's a really good example of how we do begin the design process. Most people don't know that in the 21st century, we don't make those blueprints anymore. Instead, we build a model. This image is the first step. It's a LIDAR scan that we had completed to inform our digital model. And it's called a point cloud image because there's all these little points in, in a cloud that describe the space and create the image you're seeing. And this image is standing in the Great Hall looking back toward the rotunda. To help you think about the digital model that we create, imagine you're holding an orange. If you wanna look at it in elevation, you would pull it away and look at the side. But if you wanted to create a plan of the orange, you'd cut it in half and look down at it. So our three-dimensional model allows us to imagine the building in all kinds of ways. Another important characteristic is that we can link all kinds of data to the model, which really helps our design process. So next slide. So moving up to the second floor, this 3D image illustrates a number of points. First and foremost, we're solving one of the existing environmental challenges by adding sliding glass doors between the elevator and stair core on the left and the gallery space, and also between the gallery and the grand stair. This is important because it will help us to regulate temperature and humidity to protect the art, and it's also an important fire safety improvement. It's not just a technical asset, it also enhances the visitor experience by becoming a threshold that prepares the visitor to view the gallery, enter the gallery and view the art. Next slide. In addition to, the, to, the, to these improvements to the gallery levels, rather than these sometimes confusing amalgam of gallery spaces that exist now, the new gallery organization allows for a clearer, more legible sequence of spaces, new and enlarged gallery spaces that will allow NMWA to mount more exhibitions and put more art on display. And big uninterrupted walls will accommodate the display of large pieces of contemporary art. Next slide. Moving further up to the third floor, you can see that we're continuing that strategy of separating the vertical circulation from the gallery space we're also placing walls only where they're needed. And by that, I mean where there's existing structure in the building. But in this case, we've organized the floor a little bit differently. Next slide. I also thought you might like to know and to see the care with which we've designed the lighting for the galleries. There's no more bulky, outdated cans that obscure your view of the artwork. Instead, we have a carefully integrated LED lighting design that will greatly improve the illumination. You see three diagrams on the screen illustrating how this flexible lighting design will accommodate a large work of art mounted on the wall, a small work of art mounted on the wall, and even properly illuminate a sculptural object that's held freestanding on the floor. You will see the art much better, and I know that the curators are really happy about this. Next. Not only are we improving the, the lighting for the visitor experience, but also adding Envision interactive cutting edge wired and wireless technology. This will lead to greater connectivity with an ever expanding network, better streaming capabilities and exceptionally faster response times. Next slide. Moving up to the fourth floor, I'm excited to show you this floor, which offers the most significant change over the existing layout in the museum. This is why we created an even more detailed three-dimensional model of the floor. The Learning Commons on the fourth floor combines over 3,000 square feet of new gallery space that you see to the left, the D-Tree Library that you see at the top um, right-hand side of the plan, 
and a new hands-on education studio that you see in the bottom right side of the plan, the co-location of spaces in which to see, read about art, and create art is a powerful idea that supports NMWA's vision for the future of arts education. Next. I'm happy to say that with this education studio on the fourth floor, for the first time in the museum's history, they will have a dedicated art making space in the museum. No more lugging water up onto the stage in the performance hall or worrying about the kinds of projects that might be done on the mezzanine so that the carpet doesn't get destroyed. Instead, this custom maker space will nurture all kinds of hands-on hands activities for people of all ages. In this view, it's set up for a classroom activity. Next slide. And in this view, you see it set up as a seminar room. I don't think I mentioned, but this space can be subdivided into two spaces for greater flexibility. This way, NMWA can schedule two different activities at the same time. The museum plans to offer this space to outside groups of NMWA partner organizations to enhance its ability to collaborate even more at the grassroots level. Next slide. The same is true in the library's new reading room and the Betty Dietrich Library and Research Center. This is a flexible space in terms of the furniture. The tables can be folded and moved aside for a lecture or other event like the popular NMWA book club. They will continue to have browsable stacks for visitors. And finally, I will say I'm really excited that we could create special exhibit cases to show the museum's important and I would say very intriguing collection of artist books. I hope the presentation today gave you a taste of what is to come with NMWA's renovation. I really appreciate your time and attention and I really can't wait for you to see the renovated building. Thank you. Susan? Unmute, Susan. Susan, you're muted. Thank you, Sandra, for telling me that I was muted and thank you for a great presentation. <laughs> May you're I welcome. have the next slide, please? Uh, so I just wanted to uh, also report on our campaign goal. I believe uh, most of you will have received communications from us already, but I can honestly say I'm sleeping a bit better because the museum has now reached 75% of its goal. And over the next two years, uh, we will raise the additional funds uh, to uh, reach our uh, entire goal of uh, $66 million for this uh, renovation. Next slide, please. So while we will miss being in our building, the next uh, two years are exciting for us. And I have this feeling they will just fly by. Um, we will have the building closed, but of course we will continue to be open and we'll offer a variety of online as well as in-person activities. We will have a major contemporary collage exhibition that will be in this winter and spring of 2022. And that exhibition will be scheduled for travel. We'll have a substantial loan program of artworks uh, to major institutions in Europe and the United States. There will be three public art projects that will be created for the scrim. That's the fabric that will surround the building scaffolding and that will start in spring 2022. There will be a full complement of education programs and fresh talks that will continue to be available online, as well as potentially in person as we move forward. The scholarship that happens in the Library and Research Center will continue because we're taking our books with us. And our network of now 27 state and international committees will continue their grassroots advocacy for women artists in their regions from the DMV, that means the District Maryland and Virginia, uh, to San Francisco, uh, Peru, uh, to Japan. 
And then of course, we're getting ready. Uh, and we have so much in store for all of you when we reopen. And I need you to hold on to your socks because that'll be something we talk on, uh, talk about at our next online visit. Next slide. Oh, so there are some examples of things that we have for you that are will be coming up virtually. And we're, we're obviously still open through August 8th. Uh, we will have the last week of August from the 1st until the 8th. Uh, we'll have a free we'll have free days so the museum will be open continually for that week for free and we invite you to come in and look at the collection bid it a fond farewell but just for a very short period of time really and then much of the much of what we do will be with partners around uh, Washington and then of course we will continue with all of our uh, great uh, virtual uh, programming next slide Uh, it's always important to say thank you. And uh, like today, it's all about connecting and supporting uh, the mission of the museum. Next slide. So in closing the formal part of this presentation, uh, you uh, now understand that through our renovation, we will restore and renew what I call the mothership or the pilgrimage site that is the museum. And we will have a digital presence that we have always dreamed of. And in fact, we have just hired a firm to help us to improve and create a new digital strategy for the museum that will be for the time that we're closed, uh, where the building is closed and also for the future uh, when we reopen. It will be one that enables us to best serve you, our members, and builds new audiences that help us to amplify our mission. So with this project, this major preservation and renovation project, our first since the museum opened in 1987, we will, with your support, create that space to soar. So thank you for listening and we're opening it up to questions. Yes, so I will um, pose a few that we see here. Uh, we have a question from Robin asking to please elaborate on disability access considerations. You want me to do that, Susan? Yes, please. Okay, so we are um, providing um, there's ramped access to the primary entry. We're adding a second ramp at the northwest side of the building that will bring visitors in to a new elevator lobby. So the primary public elevators will have front and rear openings and will be accessible to guests at all levels of the building. And uh, those obviously the sliding doors into the gallery spaces, we chose those rather than swing doors because they're a more gracious way for everyone to enter the gallery, but obviously make it much easier for those who are disabled. And of course, all of the toilet rooms will be designed to current standards for uh, disabled visitors. Another okay. question is, um, whether we will continue to have a cafe when the answer is yes, we will, and it will be on the mezzanine. <laughs> and actually, I've looked at the designs for that uh, cafe, and I think it will be uh, even more commodious than it is currently. I think yeah. it'll be better looking. Yeah. Much <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> yep. And um, could you reiterate the, the timeline? The, the timeline for renovation? Yes. Uh, sure. So uh, August 9th, the museum will close to the public this summer. Uh, construction will begin on September, on or around September 1st of this fall. Uh, and then that will continue for two years. Um, we will 
begin to what's called commission the museum in June of 2023. And in fall of 2024, the museum will reopen to the public with a major exhibition uh, to be announced. Again, keeping the suspense going. Um, interestingly, we have people who are interested in the staff spaces. <laughs> Sandra? <laughs> okay. Where, where will they be and will they be renovated? <laughs> yes, they, they will be renovated and they are primarily on the fifth and sixth floors. There are a couple of staff spaces related to the library on the fourth floor. And um, they are uh, all new renovated. It's a series of, of condensed offices because we needed to move all the staff up to five and six to make that lovely learning commons on four but they will be nice offices and they will certainly be renovated. And oh, I'm sorry. Susan meant to say that the museum will reopen in fall <laughs> of 2023. My mistake. That was, a, it's FY24, but fall 2023. There we so go. Just, so we'll commission in June of 23 and be ready to open in fall of 2023. Um, just one thing about the offices that I want to mention is a, a number of people have asked this question about did the pandemic change how mm -hmm. the museum was planning the spaces for staff and the answer is no be, because the way in which we need to work people need both gathering spaces and they also need work spaces that allow for quiet uh, work for contemplation uh, for research, for uh, and also for telephone calls that you don't want your neighbors to necessarily have to listen to you. So this new plan really accommodates that for the entire staff, which we think is a great win for the staff. Um, we have a question about how will we access the library? So, We'll be taking the library with us to our what's called swing uh, office space and requests will be made uh, through the library itself. Wonderful. Um, we also have uh, some programming questions about um, will we continue ha to have programs about focusing on specific women artists and virtual talks and I can certainly answer yes to that. Yes. Um, we are, we love doing them and we'll continue to do them and feel that that is an important part of our work. Let's see. Um, will we continue to issue our magazine? Yeah, it'll be, we'll, we'll actually be issuing four issues of the magazine a year while we're closed up from three. And one of those, um, one of those magazines will be uh, an, a, provide a, pr a really good re annual report on how the museum is doing. So that's a new feature, which we're very excited about with the NIMWA Women in the Arts magazine. Mm -hmm. And also I should mention that the next magazine that comes out this summer will speak to the renovation in more in greater depth. And um, will Book is Art still be on the fourth floor? Yes. And I'm really looking forward to the beautiful cases uh, that are being designed especially for the book arts and the um, galleries uh, that are, uh, as you enter the fourth floor, uh, will do, will be able to do more with book arts from time to time. Oh, uh, where is the swing space? <laughs> Can a librarian be reached by phone or email? Uh, we don't have the swing space yet. <laughs> We're just finalizing the negotiation on that. But you'll be uh, you'll be able to uh, either speak to a librarian and and uh, or uh, contact them by email. Great. Well, we're we're 
all very excited and, and look forward to staying in touch with everyone about our continued programming. You know you'll hear from us. And um, as we conclude, just reiterating what Susan mentioned about our closing week, we will have two extended evenings for members only on August um, 6th and 7th from 5 to 8 p.m. for those of you who are local. And we will also have a virtual program that week um, if you are not local on Wednesday the 4th. And um, some of the, what we've already discussed will be part of that program, but in addition, our curators, educators, and program programmers will be on the, the meeting to talk a little more about what they have planned after the museum closes its doors that no more remains open. So thank you so much, everyone. And you know where to find us, so I hope you will reach out and um, continue the conversation. Oh, and one last question I saw about um, exhibitions and, and art online. And yes, we will continue to have robust digital programming on our website. Um, you can listen to our, uh, our audio about works in the collection on our website. There's so many wonderful things to discover. I work at the museum and I continue to, step to discover <laughs> resources on the website. So I really do encourage um, exploration there. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Sandra, um, for illuminating, illuminating everyone on what's next for NIMWA. And thank you to everyone who's attended and we so appreciate your interest and your support as well as your advocacy uh, for women artists. Take care.